Good morning, everyone. As Maria said, my name is Badri, and along with many of our speakers this week, and my Swami Sananta and Maria, I'm fortunate enough to live here at Ananda Village, and I serve in our uh, community management here. Um, I'd also like to just give a nod to what a joyful privilege it is to share with you this morning and to as well share the stage with uh, Ananta and Maria, who have been very good friends and mentors and guides for me since my early days uh, here at Ananda Village. In fact, a uh, brief anecdote from that time that may relate to this topic perhaps is in my first, really first few days here, someone in the camp that we were in, in their uh, great wisdom, saw it fit to give us, to wield us with tools and put us to work digging a ditch for utility line. And we were instructed to dig carefully and we discovered a water line. Uh, we discovered it with the end of a sharp, heavy pick. <laughs> and uh, it's not important who was wielding that pick, <laughs> but um, I didn't know anything about what to do with this gushing water, but I knew in my short time here who did, and that was Ananta. So I sprinted, and I knew where he was. So I sprinted up to the upper garden. I said with terror, no doubt, Ananta, we hit a water line. And I don't know what I expected from Ananta, but it wasn't this. With a big grin on his face, all six foot 10, 400 pounds, <laughs> approximately. Ananta sprinted down the hill, he lay on his belly in the mud, and he scooped out the water in the mud. We were standing around bewildered. He found the shutoff valve. He showed us how to repair the water line. And I was shocked. And I think we all were. And this was the first of many lessons for me on drawing spiritual power from the guru, with that joyful, positive energy. And so this beautiful topic, drawing spiritual power from the guru, uh, if I were to offer some singular thing on this topic, it would be pretty simple, perhaps, if not easy. Love God and meditate. Do Kriya Yoga. Do the Guru's meditation. But this isn't a singular topic or a singular teaching. Uh, we're fortunate in that the spiritual path for us is all-encompassing. And so this beautiful power of the Guru we can draw on and need to draw on everywhere. And I would say that's one of the first and most important things we can do is acknowledge that the spiritual power of the guru is really, especially for us as disciples of Yogananda, is the only power that there is in this world. Um, many of you know the story of the young disciple, just a boy in his guru ashram, and his guru Satya Sai Baba said to him, Go home to your family and spend some time there. And he did. And when he returned to the Guru's ashram, the master asked him, how was your time? Did you spend time with your family and see your family? And the boy said, no, Baba, I saw only you. And again, he asked him, did you see your friends? Did you play with your brothers and sisters? No, he replied, Baba, only you. Finally, the Guru asked him once more, did you see your mother, your father? Did you spend time with your dear ones? Stop teasing me, Baba, he said. I see only you. So how beautiful is the spirit of the disciple, the true disciple, who sees the Guru and his power everywhere in this world. And that power is in me and you. As Maria was saying, the Guru is not a thing or a person. The Guru is everywhere when we realize that potential. That power is everywhere. I also can't help but share a brief story it happened very recently with our dear friends Narayani and Shurjo visiting at our home. And when it was time to go, Shurjo said goodbye to my son Jay, who's two, almost three years old, and Jay was having a snack. And Shurjo went in for a high five, and I said, be careful, Shurjo, he's got a lot of power in there. And Shurjo said, oh, do you have a lot of power? And Jay said, no, I have quesadilla. <laughs> he, was, he was wielding his snack. But Jay has that power. And you and I have that power of the guru. It's everywhere. 
And another teaching I would say that is really, really important on this, our path, drawing on this spiritual power, is really quite simply just to put out energy. You know, much has been said this week and said very well about the importance of directing our energy upwards and raising our energy on the spiritual path to meet circumstances, to meet challenges. And I would suggest that perhaps this is not a uh, contradictory, but in fact a complementary teaching, that we also need to put out energy in life, in every respect, uh, in order to overcome challenges, in order to face tests, and in everything we do. Uh, again and again, Swami Kriyananda exemplified this for us, that the solution to every problem, to every seeming challenge, is, is to put out energy. And hopefully that energy has a focus to it as well. And your consciousness is uplifted. But even if it's not, just putting out energy has its own positive magnetism. I had an experience of this recently when I was working with a great man and friend of mine, Ramdas, here in the community. And we were working in a remote, remote part of the community, and it was time to go from one task, one job, to the next. And we had a little bit of time to spare before we met our other friend Prakash there. And so with this few minutes of downtime, I said, Ramdas, let's get a load of firewood. There was a lot of firewood in the area, and it was easy to do with the truck. So I backed up and off the side of the road and promptly got us stuck in a ditch. <laughs> and almost without hesitation, I turned off the truck. We were listening to the Gayatri mantra. I turned off the truck, I jumped out, and I said, well, let's load up the firewood, Ramdas. I knew on some level that this wasn't a solution to our problem. I couldn't radio Prakash, he or he wasn't responding, and I, I didn't, you know, we could walk. We weren't going to die out there. <laughs> but I said, let's load up the truck. So not 10, 15 minutes later did we load up the truck with firewood, and in my two-wheel drive truck, that weight, of course, that load of the wood in the back of the truck gave me just enough to spin my wheels and climb out of that ditch. This is a few minutes later. And there we were, joyfully on our way. And so often it's these simple examples that are instructive to us on how to live our lives on the spiritual path, on how to put out more and more energy for God and Guru. Another uh, teaching, very important teaching, that I would say has been a bit of a touchstone this week is the power of spiritual community and satsang, and really in its essence, divine friendship. I was struck some weeks ago when I was sitting where you are now and I was listening to a Sunday service talk and something caught my eye. Mind you, I was listening to the talk. <laughs> but behind me here in Lotus Lake, before the lotuses were in full bloom like this, they were in circular and irregular patterns. And I observed as a lovely June breeze came down through this little valley, I observed all the water whipped up and ripples and wavelets. But over here in the corner, this circle of lotuses created a still pond where the water was totally un, undisturbed and reflecting the trees and the skies above. And I thought, isn't this beautiful? In our community, we're not apart from the world. Some of you live out there in the world. And yet we have this beautiful circle of divine friendship that creates the Guru's grace, the Guru's stillness and joy, and this ability for that energy to flow. You know, we have an internship program here at Ananda Village, and for the second year in a row now, we have a just exceptional bunch of young interns who are so devoted to the spiritual life, to service, to joy, and the spirit of Ananda. Uh, time and again, they've shown in ways large and small, just that, uh, that joyful spirit is what wins out in the end. Their camp has at times been infested with flies and flooded and last year kind of turned into a moldy swamp. And these guys just smiled and said, let's find a solution and let's fix it and let's go forward. And time and again, that inspiring spirit that we see shared through one another is really the power of the guru. You know, the other side of this teaching that 
you know, we need to put out energy. We need to have friendships and community that supports that energy is that we can't really or ever do anything. It's the Guru's grace that accomplishes anything and everything in our spiritual life. Uh, reminiscent of Maria's story of crossing the river is the story of uh, another disciple in India who, upon seeing his guru across the Ganges River, beckoning to him, without hesitation, stepped out on top of the water and a lotus flower rose to meet his foot. And with each successive step and footfall, the lotuses rose up out of the water to meet his steps. And when he crossed to the opposite bank, he knelt at his guru's feet and received his blessing and was given the name Padma Pada, a lotus foot. And isn't it so that when we put out energy with faith, the guru's grace is there and he's always there, in fact, when we need him. In the autobiography of a yogi, you may recall that when Lahiri Mahashai had this blissful experience of meeting his guru again in the Himalayas, receiving discipleship and initiation into Kriya Yoga, no doubt he was in ecstasy, golden palace and all. When it was time to go back to his life as a householder, as an accountant, he knelt and received his guru's blessing. And among other things, his guru, uh, his guru Babaji told him, Lahiri, whenever you call, I will come. And Lahiri remembered this promise. And it wasn't but a short time later that he was visiting with some friends. And he shared about this unbelievable experience, which they in fact did not believe in the Himalayas with his guru. And Lahiri said, even now I can call to him and Babaji will appear. And no doubt still in disbelief, Lahiri decided to use this promise. And he meditated, he dimmed the lights, he invoked the presence of Babaji, and lo, this luminous figure appeared in their midst. And Babaji, looking around him, exclaimed, Lahiri, you call me for a trifle? And Lahiri somewhat sheepishly said, since you're here, Master, won't you bless us? And so he stayed, and they shared Prashad, and he blessed them all. But when it was time to go again, this time Babaji departing, he said, Lahiri, from now on I will come not necessarily when you call, but when you need me. <laughs> and again, isn't it so that when we need him, no doubt God and Guru is always there. And we don't know when we need the Guru. Very often we call thinking we need him, but it isn't necessarily so. Swamiji was this way and Yogananda was, of course. Um, some of us might have emailed Swamiji or reached out to him and he never responded. And perhaps there was a reason why. You know, the Guru teaches in ways that we don't always understand. And it's important that we offer our love unconditionally and follow that guidance and that grace of the Guru. As the great poet Saint Kabir said, the Guru has made me walk without feet, see without eyes, hear without ears. My love and meditation has taken me to a land without day and night, light and darkness. The Guru is great beyond words, and great is the good fortune of the disciple. And that is our good fortune and our grace. There's one more element I'd like to share with you, uh, a very important way to draw spiritual power from the Guru is through the element of play. You know, so much of the spiritual path is seemingly perhaps hard work and meditation and selfless service, and no doubt it is, and those are joyful things too. But we also need to embrace the playful, childlike spirit of joy that is the spirit of the Guru and God. And again, didn't Swamiji exemplify this for us time and again? He was a childlike spirit of joyful, just beautiful, radiant light. In among the few opportunities I had to spend with Swamiji on a more personal level, 
I come out, uh, I count one of the most special a short visit we had with him in Lugano, Switzerland. We were visiting with Swamiji, just a few of us, in the hotel lobby there in Lugano, just chatting and having espresso. And across the lobby, a man exited the elevator with his wife, and Swamiji, making eye contact across the room, smiled ear to ear and tugged on his ear, looking at this man, grinning. And seeing this, we couldn't help but inquire. And Swamiji, noticing this, said, Ah, yes, that man. I met him at dinner last night. He's a good friend, and he is perhaps the only man in the world with ears larger than mine. <laughs> and darned if he didn't make friends everywhere he went with complete strangers and share God's joy and love and kindness. Yes, through humor, through joy, through friendliness, but always in that upward direction. He said once that sharing God's love and kindness is the most important thing we can do on the spiritual path. And another way this element of play can really manifest powerfully in our spiritual life is, of course, through nature. I was so deeply touched on Wednesday evening at what I think was the most beautiful concert I've ever heard, just uplifting and blissful beyond beyond words, and among really everything, I was deeply moved uh, as well by the performance of the birds of the air, you know, where we were expressing together that beautiful essence of Divine Mother's love and joy and beauty through the natural world. I had an experience of this recently with my daughter, Tulsi, age nearly five, and we were cooling off at the nearby watering hole, Oregon Creek. And one of our favorite things to do is to walk upstream at the creek there through the river and look for ferries. And as we embarked on this little journey, we invoked together the presence of the masters, of the nature spirits, of Divine Mother in this beautiful natural environment. And immediately as we set out hand in hand, wading through the rocks and the water, we noticed the light shimmering off the water on the rocks around us. And we saw a turtle shortly on the banks of the river. We picked him up and we played with him and we named him and set him free. We went a little further upstream, not a few minutes later. I kid you not, a single carnation, a pink flower, floated down the river and landed right in Tulsi's hands. And we continued on our way, just drinking in the joy and the beauty of nature. We found fairy villages amongst the rocks and just saw that magic of Divine Mother everywhere in nature. It's there for us to behold. And of course, our master as well, Yogananda Ji, exemplified this childlike joy and this spirit as well. You may recall this story when he was in a hotel room with uh, an adjoining door to two close disciples, Dr. and Mrs. Lewis, and they were in bed with the lights out. It was time to go to sleep, especially for Mrs. Lewis. And yet, Master exclaimed with sort of a nonsensical cry, sub gum duff. And he continued in this manner, and uh, Dr. Lewis was perhaps a little amused, at least Mrs. Lewis was not having it. She said, he's not going to disturb my sleep. And finally, when he cried out for the fourth or fifth time, again with this gleeful nonsense, super submarine sub gum duff, they just burst out laughing. And of course, the most important part of the story, what did they do after that? They stayed up the whole night talking of spiritual things, sharing a divine friendship, meditating. And this is where our friendship and our joyful spirit and our play should always lead us is towards God. Lastly, I'd like to share with you a story just briefly about a dear friend of ours who really exemplified these qualities of putting out energy of the Guru's grace and this joyful childlike spirit. His name is Andrew Banks Lyon and we knew him as Andy Lyon and 
Andy Lyon was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer at age 19. They found the node in his neck very close to his cervical spine. He was a student at UC Berkeley at the time studying astrophysics. And Andy underwent the traditional treatment of radiation and chemotherapy, and the cancer went into remission. But only a short while later, it came back again, this time more aggressive. And again, he underwent the called for treatment, this time more intense, of a stem cell transplant. Again, the treatment was successful, the cancer went into remission, and again it came back some weeks later. This time, his body was riddled with tumors, and Andy decided then to go on a healing journey, a spiritual healing journey. And so he left traditional Western medicine behind, and he studied Ayurveda, the Vedic science of healing and medicine, and continued his quest, which brought him here to Ananda Village sometime around 2011. And in fact, it brought him to the tiny town of North San Juan. He wasn't looking for Ananda, of course, but it found him. And he showed up here kind of on our doorstep and he became a disciple and took initiation into Kriya Yoga and continued his healing journey here for about a year or so uh, living in the Guru's ashram. And after a time when it became clear to Andy that his healing journey would not end in the healing of his physical body, he decided to spend whatever time he had left on earth uh, on a different kind of journey. He set out to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, 2,300 miles from Mexico to Canada. And he didn't have experience with this kind of hiking, but he knew that was what he was inspired to do. And with Guru's grace and power, he could do it. So he set out and hiked sometimes 20, 30 or more miles a day with shooting pain down his leg and no doubt throughout his body. They called him by his trail name Astro and he made friends everywhere he went on the trail and he drank in the beauty of nature, the trees, the mountains, the rivers and just had the most beautiful experience despite his struggles. Uh, he did complete that journey. He stumbled into a hospital in the state of Washington just at the end of his journey, but only after a short treatment was on his way to finish at the Canadian border in the snow amidst the trees there. And there's a photo of him with a blissful smile. Having completed that journey, Andy, a short time later, returned here to Ananda village to die. And he passed away peacefully on a Friday morning in August, just like this, with a smile on his face at the Crystal Hermitage. And we all went over for pizza after that to visit with him. A very short time later, we held an astral ascension ceremony with Ananta and Maria for Andy just through the trees here at Hansa Mandir. And some of you may remember that day five years ago on a morning like this, a very unusual and beautiful double rainbow appeared in the sky stretching from the Crystal Hermitage over Hansa Temple. And we knew that God and Guru were smiling uh, with joy, with this grace and this power on their child, on their chela, their disciple Andy Lyon, as they are on all of us. I'd like to close with a prayer from Master's East-West Magazine, published nearly a hundred years ago. Father, I will drink thy vitality through the fountains of sunshine. I will drink thy peace through the silver cup of mooned nights. I will drink thy power in the mighty cup of the wind. I will drink thy consciousness in all the little cups of my thoughts. I will drink thy bliss in my blissful thoughts. I will drink thy joy in my joy. May the power and bliss of God and Guru be ever ours.